Okay, so we're coming back today to talk about the portfolios again. So it, don't, don't think we're done with SketchUp. We're gonna come back to SketchUp and we're gonna keep working. Next week on Monday, we will do the section views through your SketchUp model. And then on Wednesday, which is your last official day of class, we will do uh, the perspective views. So we'll spend two more days doing SketchUp into Photoshop, doing the collage work, et cetera. The, the end one, obviously the perspective view is kind of the ultimate one. That's the one everybody wants to do. So we'll do that one last. Those um, are part of your assignment 106. Assignment 106 is due the same day as the final. And I apologize for that, but it's just how it works out this semester. So it's gonna be due the same day as the final, uh, which is Monday the 21st. Monday the 21st, you're going to come in and you're going to put your portfolio in the back on the table. Um, next to it, next to where you put your portfolios, there'll be a little handout with a survey. Uh, you'll go onto the computer, you'll type in the web address, or I have a link on the website, and you'll fill out a little survey about what you thought worked in the class, what you thought didn't work in the class. Um, I use that every semester to tailor the class for the following semester. So if you say, oh man, the Charlie Harper was awful and you know, I really, I think you, instead of just saying it was awful and I hated it, tell me what you think would be better instead of the Charlie Harper. I'm picking on the Charlie Harper because I don't like the Charlie Harper. I'm tired of it. I've done it for 10 years and I'm over it. So, but I haven't found something better yet that works as an assignment for Illustrator. So I'm kind of still struggling to, to find something else. So I'll ask you about, you know, what, what the assignments were, what did you like, what did you not like? And you'd be surprised how much that really feeds back into the course in the following semesters. So it does really help. Uh, just like if you go on to Berkeley or if you go on to Cal Poly, if you shoot me an email at the end of the semester and tell me these are the kinds of things we're learning, that helps too because I try to prep you for those, those sorts of things. So you'll fill out a survey. Next to the surveys, there'll be a bunch of boxes of donuts which is not to bribe you to give me better survey results. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the fact that I believe philosophically um, in, in the idea of architecture and architecture school, design school, you work really hard to get to a, a milestone place. And in a studio class, that's usually a big presentation that you have at the end. And I believe that the person who's hosting the studio, the person who's in charge of the studio, should provide some kind of sustenance at the very end. Um, and it's something that was always done at Berkeley and it's something that I believe that I can do here too. Even though you're just handing in a portfolio and it's not a big presentation or anything, you still get donuts at the end. It's also, it's just one of those things I kind of like donuts and it's twice a year I get to have donuts. So it's, it's, there's a little bit of selfishness on that too. But um, you'll find uh, as you move on in your careers, you have a big review. Typically somebody brings in cookies or drinks or, or that kind of thing, not real drinks, but you know, orange juice or something. And um, you have that as part of the celebration of the, of the, the final reviews. And so it's just something to, to look forward to and, and to mark that milestone. So um, that'll happen on the day of the final, which is Monday the 21st. Class here on that day starts at 8, same as always, ends at 10. Not at 11, it ends at 10, because some of you might potentially have a final at 10.30. So you get a half hour break between finals. That's how final schedules work. So you'll get off at 10 and you're free to go. For this class, for 135, 10 is the end of class. So anything left, any resubmits, any comments, any posts, any of that kind of stuff that you need to do needs to happen before 10 that day on the 21st. After that, it's all irrelevant because class is over. For my other class, for those of you that are in that one, uh, that one ends at 1230. So same, same rules apply. Everything has to be turned in, et cetera. So just, I like to kind of put that out there so that you know. And then you're completely done with this class and you can go off onto your summer break. Actually, you can go off and stress out about all your other finals and then you can go on your summer break. But anyway. So today we're gonna come back to the, the whole portfolio discussion. Hopefully you've spent a little bit of time working on it. Ideally, you've spent a lot of time working on it. If you haven't spent any time working on it, maybe you've thought about it, that would be good. And if you haven't done any of those, Now's your wake up call because it's coming in about a week and a half. You're gonna turn this in. So today as part of the lecture, I'm actually gonna talk about the cover and what should, what should go on the cover, what does cover, what does the cover look like and that sort of thing. I'll show you a bunch of examples as we go forward today. I will also go into my office and grab previous semester's portfolios and stick them in the back on the table so you can look at them and uh, get ideas from what other people have done in the past. So what belongs on a cover? Well, if you're turning in a portfolio of your work, the most fundamental thing that needs to be on the cover is, guess what? Your name. 
That really belongs there. And if this is, if this is your work, then why wouldn't you want to claim it as your work? If you're handing it to a future employer, your name should be on the front. They need to be able to find that easily. So that's probably on there. I have a list of optional things that some people like to include on the front. Sometimes, let's say, um, when I was applying to grad school, on the front cover it was mandated that you put what candidate you were. So I was an option two candidate, so I had to put that on the cover. Not always in a portfolio are you going to have something like that that's required, but be aware that sometimes you do have to have to do it. So all these other options, portfolio, design portfolio, architecture portfolio, selected works, any of that kind of thing can be relevant. The other thing that can be relevant but is optional is a year or a date range. The idea here is that this is a portfolio with a certain version. You're always going to be evolving the portfolio. You're always going to be putting new things into the portfolio, and as a result, putting a year on the cover might be a good idea. So this might be your portfolio 2018. It might be your portfolio spring 2018. I don't know. So we'll start first with a bunch of examples that I consider to be text only. And these are loose examples. Some of these will have little logos next to them. But the dominant feature is just text on these covers. So we might have something like this, gray background, name, Architecture portfolio, that's it. Font choice, typography, all critical. This is your opening impression of who this person is and what their interests are. When you're looking through a stack of portfolios and you're picking out one to look at, one of them will grab your attention. Think about your portfolio in a stack of everybody else's portfolios. What makes yours special? How does that design-wise tell you something? Sometimes it's really simple, lower right corner. Name, interior architect, that's it. This one, again, it's got a little signature. I've seen people do the signature thing. Unless you have a really cool signature, like this person happens to, it's pretty hard to make it work. This one just kind of flows nicely, and it feels good at that size. If you've ever done your signature and you've blown it up before, you realize that it's not that attractive. <laughs> So be aware that it doesn't always work to do something like this. But in this case, it worked really nice. And again, you've got the scribble of the signature, and then you've got the name and interior design. So each one of the ones that I've shown you so far, architecture design, interior architect, interior design, they've all said something different. But they all kind of mean the same thing. Another example here, a little bit different graphically, centered. Logo, certainly, with a little bit of color, but the text still pretty much dominates. So in this example, there's not the name isn't leaping out at you. And so that's something to be aware of. And I don't know whether this is, is something you really want to do. If we look really carefully down there, his name is or her name, I don't know is right down there above architecture portfolio, but you kind of have to strain to see it. And so is that really something that you want when you have your portfolio in a stack of portfolios at an office, you're applying for a job? Probably not. I would consider making your name a little bit bigger. Another example here. So let's look at text with some kind of an abstract background. So all of those were pretty much text on blank page, text on color, something like that. These ones have some kind of a background behind. So here we have name, design portfolio, and behind it, we've got an image. We see something going on. It's kind of interesting. It's kind of a model. But we can't tell what it is or, or how it's relevant to anything that's inside the portfolio. But it might start to grab your interest. I think this is a good photograph. All the shadows make it interesting. Some of the shadows carry over so that that bottom white bar is semi-transparent makes it kind of interesting. But again, it's abstract. It's not something that's specific. Another example here with the, the, the grid or the mesh. The ink splat. I think this is pretty good except for where the person's name is. Somehow the drop shadow fakeness of it just kills it. So if you're doing something like this, Make it so that there's like a piece of tape that's actually stuck, and it's, it's as if you layered it up and painted it somehow instead of using the drop shadow. 
I actually really like this one. I think it's very clean. The brushed aluminum background, it's an image, not actual aluminum, but it has a certain quality to it, a certain materiality to it. Um, the lettering, however, is a little bit thin. And this is one of, the, the, one of the, the challenges with using white letters, is that when you go to print this, it's going to probably wash out, and you're not going to be able to see it. If you look at this on a screen, you could still see the crispness of the letters, and the white will still show through. Certainly, if you look at it on an iPad or, or on one of the high-resolution displays that are out now, the Retina displays, this would be really crisp. But try doing a test print and see what it looks like. In this example, the letters just wouldn't be thick enough to, to be printed accurately. Another example here, this is on a cork background uh, with the lettering in front. These are really popular, these ways of breaking down the letter or, or, or the, the, the title here, portfolio. To me, this is almost impossible to figure out what it says. And I know it's a portfolio, and it's still hard to read what is going on here. Uh, so just be aware that sometimes this looks really good in an idealized sense, and then take a step back and, and show it to your neighbor and say, does this make any sense? Can you see what this is, what this is saying? Another example here with kind of the abstract plan behind. I think it's important to be careful of showing too much of this style of a plan, uh, even though this is just in the background, because it's a very draftsperson type plan. It's not necessarily as architectural. So you need to be aware of that as part of it. I think this one's another example uh, on the, the brushed aluminum. I think it looks pretty good. This one might actually be printed on real brushed aluminum. Another example there. Photographic background. So this is still kind of an abstract texture of concrete, but it is an actual photograph. Diagram as the abstract. Little 3D model. This one is designed to be uh, a full spread. It folds around. So if I were, the fold would be right here. This would be one half of the page there. This would be the back half of the page. Does that make sense? So they fold around. Another example here with the city skyline. This is fairly popular. If you do a uh, Google search for portfolio covers, you'll see lots of these, this style. We've talked about Alex Holgreth before. I've shown you images of his, his work before. I actually showed a, you a bunch in the last portfolio lecture. Um, this is his volume three portfolio. And it has a little bit more architectural flair to it. We can actually see the drawing behind. But the way that it's folded around the portfolio makes it feel a little bit more abstract. We're not seeing a true drawing. We're focused on what the text is saying, not what the background is. I think it's a really nice combination. Uh, that leads us into using a project as a backdrop. There you can see it unfolded so that it's flat, so you can see the front and the back at the same time. So that one leads us into using your work as a background to the portfolio. So maybe you still, ha you still have the text, but then you're using some piece of your work as the background, um, which can be an interesting strategy because you're giving a little bit of a preview of what's going on on the inside. Obviously, you want to pick your best work. If you put your worst work on the cover, that's not the best strategy in the world. So you pick whatever the best piece of your work is, and it may give you a little bit of a sense of what's happening on the inside or what you're interested in on the inside. This particular one is laser cut engraved. And I'll show you a few more cut ones a little bit later on. I think this one's really nicely done. I think the typography is excellent, and the sketch somehow just feels good as part of the cover. The thing here that you have to be careful of, though, is that if you emphasize or overemphasize your, your sketches, you might end up being placed in a place that expects you to do more sketching. So a good, a good example of this, I had two students who went to Berkeley. And I don't think I've told you this story before. Maybe I have. If I have, then it is what it is. You get it twice. I had two students who went to Berkeley. And they showed up on the first day for 100A. And one of the things that you do in 100A is you show your portfolio in the beginning, and it helps the people who are in charge of 100A, or at least you used to do this, uh, it helps them decide which subsection of a studio you would be in. So in, 100, in, in 
At DVC, we have a studio. We have 220. You're all in the same class. The same person's in charge. You're all part of that same group. You know, there's 24 of you or 30 of you or whatever. At Berkeley, you go to a studio, um, let's say 100A, there might be 100 of you in class or 120 of you in class. Much bigger class, but you're broken down into small groups of 10 to 15 people. And that's your actual studio group. And so there might, in 100A, there might be five different professors who are actually teaching 100A. You all come to lecture together. They, the various people that are part of the, 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 the various faculty that are teaching the studio, each one will give a lecture on a different day. You'll get different perspectives. It's a really cool way of having your studio set up. Anyway, on the first day you show up and you have to fit into one of those five different sections of 100A, one of those five different groups of 10 to 15 people. And so somehow they have to divide you up based on your interest or your skill level so that you fit into one of those groups. And the way that they used to do it, and I assume that they still do it the same way, they might not anymore, uh, was they said, let me see some of your work. If you had a portfolio, that was great. Otherwise, you'd show them you know, some, of, some of your work. And they'd decide who you belonged with. So I had these two students who went, and this is a long time ago. This is probably 2010 or 11, something like that. I had these two students who went. Both of them were great. Both of them were, were great in Rhino. They did a great job rendering, et cetera. And they were both very interested in that part the 3D modeling, the rendering, that sort of thing. They showed up on the first day, and one student's portfolio had all rendering stuff in it and had a lot of emphasis on that. The other student didn't have a portfolio particularly well prepared. He had some work that he'd done. He had it kind of collected together, and it was all hand drawings. They presented both of that. Though, even though they had the same interest, the student with the hand drawings got placed in a studio where they did hand drawing the whole time. The, stu the student with the computer work got placed in the studio with the computer. And so this is something to be aware of that that changes and that changes your perspective. If you go to work for or if you want to apply for a job, on the other hand, and you show a portfolio of work and it's all hand drawing, they might say, yeah, you're not quite for us. We need somebody who's, who's better on the computer. So you need to be a little bit aware of what your goal is in this process as to how much you show. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't show some sketches. I'm not saying eliminate those altogether. Just don't overemphasize it if you don't want to overemphasize it. So you want to think about it. Something like this on the cover works really nice. I think it's very well done, and it would entice me to want to see this particular portfolio. The good news about this is if I opened it up and saw a bunch of 3D models, I'd see versatility. So it can work in your favor. Just be aware and make it a conscious decision. Another example here with a little rendering at the bottom. I actually think this is a pretty dynamic piece. This is a, some kind of a model that was photographed. And I think the photograph was really well done. The lighting in it is really nicely done. And it works with the white text. So it's good composition. This one with the red, I appreciate the, the add of color. But somehow it doesn't quite, other than there's color, and I'm not seeing too much. Another example here with the sketches. I think this is a good one because you notice the text says student design portfolio. This person's claiming that they're still a student, so they're still learning. The front cover of this looks like somebody who's learning to me. The way the sketches are laid out, the overlays of trace, it feels pretty good. It has a really strong diagonal to it, so compositionally it's nice and inviting. Another example here, some of these on the projector end up being a little bit too dark, so they're hard to see. But that would be the full color rendering. Behind. Text with a model background. So this is where you're actually photographing something you built, some kind of a physical object. And that can work nicely. As part, of your, uh, uh, as part of your portfolio cover. I think this one's well done with the, with the model. Obviously, if you're not good at building models, don't photograph the model and put it on the cover. If you are good at building the models, it's a great place to showcase your skill uh, or to include that as part of your, as part of your work. I had a, when I was in grad school in one of my studios, the guy who sat next to me was a model builder. Like You could classify him as a model builder. He didn't draw much, but he built models. And so he would go, like we'd have studio on Monday, and he'd need to work out some design ideas. And by Wednesday, he'd have 10 new models. 
And I'm not saying like he took his model and modified it a little bit. Like he would build 10 from scratch brand new models. Present them at studio. We go on to the next section from Wednesday to Friday. He built 10 more models. I mean, the guy was a machine. It was really cool. And he would just, that's how he worked. He built these models and they were beautiful models. If that's you, then you want to emphasize that. You want to show that. Another example here. Cutouts. This is another thing that, that became a little bit trendy uh, with laser cutters, is the idea that you could cut out or engrave the cover. So in this case, they're using a piece of white acrylic, and they've cut out part of the lettering here, and then they've engraved part of the lettering. It can be a pretty neat strategy for, for making that front cover of your work. Instead of doing it in acrylic, you could do it in chipboard or uh, museum board or something like that and cut it out that way. You could even do it out of, um, let's say, just a watercolor Bristol, 140 pound cold press or something. Uh, recognize, of course, if you laser cut it, you're going to end up with uh, some little burn marks on the edges. But that's certainly a strategy. If this is the case and you want to pursue something like that, you have to think a lot about what happens on the next page. Because that next page is what you see through as part of the lettering. Here's another example of a cutout, again, using the white acrylic as the cover. Obviously, you have to think about the letters, too, to make sure that they stay attached and don't fall out. So that's something that's certainly an option. When we get into binding options, this is the other major thing that you're going to have to decide about in the next week and a half, is how is your book going to be bound together? And that's why I'll bring the examples out. And it's also why in the back covers of all the portfolios, there should be at least on all the newer ones in the last five years or so, there should be a, a sticky note or a label or something on it that says where they had it bound and how much it cost. And some of them, are, they say, I bound it myself, or self-bound. Self That's certainly an option. So we'll start with traditional. These are the kinds of bindings that are available at Staples or Office Max or Kinko's, FedEx, whatever. Uh, these are the traditional bindings. Most common is the spiral bind. And most of these you're familiar with. Uh, the idea here is that it's generally plastic, and it's just a loop of plastic that's a spiral that gets twisted into a bunch of holes on your, on your, uh, on your booklet. It's really good for one-sided books, but it's not so good for two-sided books. And that's because as you open it, one half of the page goes up or goes down when it lays flat. And I'll show you an example of that in just a second. Uh, it does take about a quarter of an inch for the binding. So you're going to lose content in the very middle of your spread because of all the holes that are punched through. So you want to pay attention to that. So here it is. Here's your example. You've got a flow line across the top. I looked forever to find an architectural portfolio that did this. I can probably find some um, in the examples. And so as you open this book, the left page goes down slightly. We can see it right here. The left page goes down slightly, which causes this flow line here not to match up with that flow line. So that slight shift is a real big deal. Now, depending on your content, you might be able to get away with it. But if you have something like this one that has the big black bar at the top and has the double bars at the bottom, you can really see this shift happening. And it's not necessarily the best strategy for the binding. So the other option that we have there's another, there's another close up of it, is called a comb binding. These can be plastic or they can be metal. Depends on where you're having it bound. Um, the plastic ones tend to be a little bit on the chunky side. They're pretty fat um, and they can, they can kind of be blocky on one end. It's, it's good to be aware of it. The metal ones tend to be a little bit thinner, a little bit lighter, and can work out rather nicely. Not every place does metal comb bindings. You can call around and find out. Staples used to have a really good metal comb binding, and I don't know if they still do it or not. So that's the other thing about these places is sometimes they do something for a while, and they change products, and they can't do it anymore. Um, because this opens flat, there's no alignment issues. One page isn't going to be higher than the other. So it's a really nice option for you. It again takes about a quarter of an inch for that binding. So all those little holes that are punched through means you're going to lose content. Not so big of a deal if you have an image spanning across the, the, um, the center seam. If, however, you have text anywhere close to that, you might get text chopped out. So be aware of that fact. There's some example of the metal comb bindings. These are a lot lighter weight 
and they feel, they feel rather nice. Another example here. So I'm showing you all the metal ones because I think they look a little bit nicer. And then we get into the handmade and the specialty bindings. Now, for this class, it's unrealistic to actually have a professional print shop um, you know, print and bind yours into like a real book. Now, there's a lot of online uh, publishers that will do this. So long term, if you want yours bound into a really nice, clean book, uh, professionally done, et cetera, you can actually send your portfolio draw drawings off to a professional publishing house. They'll print it, they'll bind it, and they'll send it back to you. That's certainly an option. Um, you don't have enough time for that to happen right now, so you could do something like this yourself. So you could, you could create the binding yourself using glue or staples. You could hide that binding with a little bit of uh, paper. You could especially cut a little piece of paper. I used to have my grad school portfolio uh, as one of the sample portfolios where I actually did bind it myself. And you can see how I combined it together. Somehow, over time, it walked off. And so I don't have that one anymore. Um, but these are, these are the kinds of things that you could create if you wanted to. I have had a, a several students in the past hand sew their pages together with thread. That works. The old days, that's how books were made. So you could do something like that. You can get creative about your glue a little bit. That's out of place. I don't know why that's there. Sorry. Happens. Um, if, you're, if you're doing it where you're hand binding it, think about the seam uh, of your binding and making sure that the cover can open. There's a fold line there. If you don't put that in, it won't open as easily or it won't open as far. This is a good example here with a little bit of an extra fold that helps that book open up. You could do it, you could score the back with a little X-Acto blade, not all the way through, just lightly, and that would help it open too. These ones are hand sewn in the corners, a little hard to see, just the corners are sewn together with little holes. And this is one of the professional print versions, where it becomes almost like a book. And that's, that's something you'd have to send out. Uh, and it's not something that's realistic in the timetable that you have to complete. Another example here of the folded pages kind of coming together. OK, so for the remainder of the time today, you have the whole day to work on your portfolio. I suggest in the handout for exercise 127 that you work on the cover because you're going to have to have a cover soon. If you feel like you just want to spend more time in InDesign working on the InDesign part, that's OK too. You now have almost all the content that needs to go in the portfolio. You're going to be adding your SketchUp drawings as well. So that's the last piece of the puzzle. If you're in 121 or if you're in 220, um, include that those those drawings those those projects in as well maybe you did some work in 120 or maybe you're doing some work in 120 you might want to include those so it's not a bad thing to include more work the easy thing in a portfolio is to edit work out put it in and if you don't like it pull it out it's just an InDesign file it's easy to skip those particular pages etc okay so I'm gonna give you the rest of the time to work if you want me to come and look at a, a page or two that's fine when it comes to posting today, I suggest you post the cover. But if you also want to post some pages to try to get some comment feedback from your, your neighbors, that's not a bad thing either. So you could, you could publish a few pages with it um, to try to get some more feedback. OK? Any questions? Yeah? Perfect, see? <laughs> For the binding, plus the plus the cost of printing the pages. Um, so, uh, um, and you guys can do double sided. 
<laughs> right. Yeah. That's the one thing. The, the printers that are over here, uh, which some people will elect to try to print here, which you're more than welcome to try, um, the printer doesn't by default do double-sided. You can choose double-sided in the options, and the little screen will tell you how to flip your paper over and reload it so that it goes back through the other direction. You can try it if you want. Or you can go to some place that actually does double-sided printing. So just be aware of that. The paper quality can help. When you look at the samples that I bring out, you'll see that a lot of them have a higher paper quality. That's, again, something that you can get at one of the, the, the copy and print centers because you can get a little bit thicker paper, and that can improve the look of the portfolio. The one other thing that I will say is this is the one time in the class where I'm not going to grade the online version of the portfolio. I'm going to grade the printed version of the portfolio. So what you hand me or what you put on that back table before you eat your donut is what I'm going to end up grading as this. So I recognize that image quality is not always perfect when you print it, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to be a stickler on that. However, you need to see the actual book. That's what this purpose is. It's not an online portfolio. It's an actual book that you could hand somebody, an employer, or somebody in studio, and say, this is my work. And you need to be proud of that. Okay. Thanks for that. I appreciate it.